now begun. My name is Dan Silverman and welcome to the August Sand Coordinator Call. We're in the dog days of August, which is at least not, not my favorite phrase because dogs are one of my favorite animals and August is my least favorite month by far. So it's always been very conflicting when I hear people say that, but I just I just said it anyway. Get you guys thinking here at the end at the beginning of the call. We are going to start things off with Russ Poole, and it has been a busy summer for the Department of Ed. Russ, take it away. Great, thank you, Dan. Thank you uh, all. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, we're going to do a brief update here about uh, what all is going on at the at the federal level, and so we'll. Uh, we'll hear about that. Uh, we will take a few questions, but we've got a lot of things on the uh, calendar today, and so we will want to uh, get onto those. And then, uh, then we do have a discussion, I think, coming up uh, uh, pretty soon, where we can get more into the questions on on this. And so, and Cheryl may say a little bit about that at the end of my my talk. So let's go back. I, was, uh, I started wondering about how far do I want to go back. Well, we'll we'll go back to May at least, or even even a little bit before that, that you, you may recall that uh, for the state auth federal state authorization regulations that were issued in 2016, that the Department, U.S. Department of Education had decided to postpone those. Um, National Education Association and others filed a lawsuit um, for all sorts of reasons where they wanted those rules to go into place. In May of this year, um, uh, the NEA won that lawsuit, which essentially put those uh, uh, regulations, I guess in April that they won it, but it, the regulations then went into place uh, uh, in late May uh, so that they're there. And then uh, we weren't hearing very much from the uh, department about that. But or, or, And so as soon as the uh, NEA won the lawsuit, then uh, uh, WCT and SAN wrote a letter to the Department of Education uh, and to the courts talking about, uh, well, that's wonderful, but what about all these uh, different impacts that we'll have and that there's all sorts of clarifications we need about what those rules mean. And the rest of this will be about uh, one of those very things and that has to do with the uh, complaint issue and especially the impact on on uh, students who are, are in California. So uh, you may also recall that the, so then, uh, we heard nothing back from that. We were trying to not go to the press and not raise all sorts of alarm, but trying to get the department and the courts to work together to come up with a happy landing for, for students. But uh, uh, instead, uh, the department came out with uh, uh, its notice uh, saying that, oh, oh, by the way, the 2016 regulations are in place and have been since May 29th. And oh, by the way, California, that you're complaint process, you don't have a complaint process for uh, public and nonprofit institutions that are serving students at a distance in uh, students who are uh, uh, in California. And so those don't meet the regulations. And so those students are essentially ineligible for aid that uh, we heard that the department thought that meant only like 500 students, but then uh, NC Sarah did the math and came out like a uh, later that week or the next week came out and estimated that it was uh, closer to what we were thinking was like 80,000 students is what they were saying that would be affected. Well, that's pretty substantial. Um, get that. And then it also could affect, uh, uh, while well, Sarah covers the, so students who attending Sarah Institute, enrolled in Sarah institutions in Sarah states that they should be okay. But if you had a non-Sarah institution in many of the other states that there would have uh, problems as well. And that we, um, and that uh, with that, that there was uh, uh, no estimate about how many students those were at that time. Okay, so what's next? Lots of hubbub, lots of things going on, uh, uh, which you got involved in trying to help. Uh, NC Sarah was really trying to figure out what they could do. Um, California leadership was really uh, working on it. And in a, um, uh, uh, California then submitted to the Department of Education uh, a complaint process, uh, but that complaint process would refer student to an agency, which is different than what the U.S. Department of Education was looking for, which was that there'd be some sort of direct over, oversight 
so that there'd be, um, I won't use quite the right words, but essentially some sort of consequence or some sort of uh, uh, direct oversight by by an agency in, in there. And so um, the department was sort of in a pickle and what to do about that because they were trying to resolve it. And then they um, I have to hand it to them. I think they came up with a good uh, um, compromise that they said that while it doesn't meet uh, uh, a fully compliant California's uh, process was not fully uh, compliant with what they wanted that they said they assumed that California would uh, would uh, fix that and that students served by out-of-state public and nonprofit institutions you know going back to May 29th uh, that they should be they'll, they will be okay for uh, receiving federal financial aid and that uh, they'll move forward and then the other thing that the department said that they would do is that they're going to work really hard and release the 2019 negotiated uh, state authorization regulations early. And one of the reasons they wanted to do that was that this requirement for a state complaint process was was removed from from that uh, from those regulations, and so that would take care of this whole issue once they uh, once they once they uh, release that and put that out, and then uh, we're thinking that will probably be sometime in September. I know they were hoping to get it out in August, but that's not going to happen. Um, so I think they're hoping that that will be in September. The big question is going to be, what all, for that state authorization regulation, what all part of it will they release? You know, Can they keep it just to this complaint uh, part of the regulation, or will it be the whole set of state authorization regulations? Because um, if they could keep it to the complaint part, that helps quite a bit. Um, uh, but if they release the whole state authorization thing, then then all these other things will suddenly be in place, and we may have a whole new problem in terms of being out of compliant on notifications and other things that are part of that. So uh, we don't quite know exactly what they're going to do, but it'll be something for all of us to enjoy and to watch. And, 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 and we all enjoy... Uh, and have experienced this before where, where there's some uh, uh, uncertainty about all this. And so we're waiting to see what comes of that. We'll be um, watching for it and certainly uh, giving you advice and opinions as that, as that comes out. With that, that was a very quick explanation of a very complex set of events that happened over the last few months. Uh, those of you who were on vacation over the summer are saying, what the heck happened there? Uh, with that, and I'll turn it to Cheryl or Dan to see if there's anything that I uh, forgot or left out. Let's see. That was very comprehensive, Russ. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Are you all seeing my screen okay? It's the homepage of the SAN website? Yes. Okay. Um, I point this out, and we started with this instead of the agenda, so that you all can see that the SAN homepage is a really good tool um, to be able to see what the latest updates are. We updated this, you know, with each of the new um, notifications that went out, whether it was from the department or whether it was from the California um, DCA. Um, so we keep that up to date as well as provide events. So if you were to scroll down, you would see that it's usually not this long, but since July 22nd, um, which is just a little over a month ago, um, we've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of activity. So this is a place where you'll find all the latest activities that we're going to have events with SAN, but also latest announcements. So if you want access to that, we also hyperlink the documents that support those announcements. So if you wanna read the documents themselves, you can find them right here, um, as well as you'll see in the, the right-hand column, quick links to um, to uh, important tools that you may need. But Russ covered that all very well. Um, you know, we are waiting to see uh, what is going to happen. I expressed some disappointment recently when I found out the department had, um, had sought to dismiss the appeal because I was really looking forward to reading the legal argument. Um, you know, for the for their appeal, but they've they have opted to um, to seek a dismissal of their appeal. So that means this, that the ruling stands, and um, so all of the 2016 regulations for state authorization are in fact uh, in place and are not being the the lawsuit to put that in place um, is not going forward with the appeal. Um, so you can find uh, things there, but but Russ, as Russ indicated, we'd be happy to take a few questions today. We're going to talk about it. Um, 
more in an open forum on the second Tuesday of the month. You'll recall that one of our activities, our events is called Open Forum. It's open to anybody that's part of a SAN um, membership. So as your other non-coordinator colleagues uh, can participate on the open forum. And that is gonna be a place where we just have a conversation. And so you can ask your questions. We can interact about what we believe may happen. And as Russ indicated, uh, some of this is speculation right now. We have heard directly from the department that they mean to expedite the 2019 regulations, but we don't know which exactly that means whether it's all or part. Um, so we're waiting to find out that as well. So we will be looking for that and you will find, you know, we always provide uh, direct updates by our email um, distribution list, but we'll also put it here on the website. Dan, is there anything else that you? No, nothing, nothing for me. There is a question in the, com in the comment box. Yeah, and I see there's a question from April, and that's a good question, and Cheryl was started to, to go to it. And so the question is that if the Department of Education decides to implement new rules early, would that include the professional licensure disclosure regulation? And that's the part of it that we are not clear on. We're, uh, you know, are they able to limit it just to this uh, complaint issue, or do they have to put out the entire uh, state authorization uh, regulation all at once. My guess is, is that they would have to put it all out at once, but I don't know for sh know for sure. But that that would so that's a good question about is the professional licensure disclosure regulation. Uh, let's say that that suddenly goes into effect uh, sometime in the middle of September, end of September. Um, unless they give us a lot more guidance. And we've seen so far, there's all sorts of questions about what you have to do in order to be in compliance. And also we all know that it takes a while to be in, that if you haven't been um, doing that in terms of the professional licensure uh, disclosures, uh, that it takes a while to get that done. And so that will be, uh, while we will have fixed one problem, we may have create, may create a new one. And, and not only that, we don't know how fast the turnaround will be. If they release the final regulations, we're not entirely sure when that means they become effective. And even if they do come, become effective, will there be some sort of delay to any part of the regulations? If they were to delay um, the enforcement for the um, disclosure portion, you know, there, there are any number of um, mixes and matches that could occur here. So we are definitely, as Russ said, in looking for guidance. Plus they have to answer our questions that we submitted for um, public comment. Uh, we asked for a lot of clarification in our public comment, as you saw in our public comment is, is listed here on our website. Um, we asked a lot of questions, including how to um, accurately prepare those disclosures, you know, what they're looking for and how to um, define um, you know, what they were talking about in terms of location um, and uh, date of enrollment, you know, things of that sort, so, or location of during enrollment. Um, so we're looking for that kind of clarification as well. So there will be a lot to share when it becomes available. Okay. Seeing nothing else on chat, I wonder if we should sure. turn it back to Dan for our next speaker. Very good. Great. Thank and you. I'm go and if you all want to check the homepage out, it's here. I'm going to move now to our regular agenda. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Russ. Great. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. And thanks especially to Russ. Um, now we are going to ha allow Lori Williams. We're so excited to have her, the new president, chief executive officer of NC Sarah, to come on and introduce herself and, and say a couple words. This is a um, a month on the job, maybe something like that, Lori. Is Lori here? I'm not seeing her on her listed at the moment. Oh, yeah, here she is. Lori may be trying to get in by phone. Um, Lori, if you want to put in the chat, we'd be happy to try to help you um, gain access. I see your video, but are you trying to also come in by phone? Okay, well, why don't we give Lori a minute? Um, 
might you go ahead, Dan, and, and introduce our, our next speaker, and I'll work with Lori. Lori, you can direct message me, and I'll try to work on getting you access. Okay? Okay, sure. Emily, are you, are you here? Hi, Dan. I am. Can you hear me okay? I am. So we're, we're delighted to have Emily Jacobson from MEC to continue our geographic tour of the United States. We went west, we went south, now we're going to the Midwest. Uh, to get the state portal entity perspective on state authorization. Emily, go ahead. You're, you're heading to the Midwest in August, which is perfect because I'm, I'm busy oh, trying to I, soak I, up I the rest of the summer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join your call today and for giving me a few minutes of your time. Uh, my name is Emily Jacobson. I'm the director for Amphara at Mac, Western Higher Education Compact. Uh, I've worked with uh, Sarah at MEC for about five and a half years now, and my sixth year will be in January. So uh, working with Sarah has been a pretty amazing adventure uh, to see Sarah grow and evolve uh, over the last five and a half years. We had no member states, no participating institutions, to now having uh, nearly every state and territory on board with approximately 2,000 institutions participating. Uh, Dan told me that you had a chance to hear from the W. Sarah director at Wichi, uh, Christina Sedney, uh, and then the S. Sarah director at SREB, Wanda Barker, um, and it sounds like they touched on the general role that the regional compact plays in administering Sarah, um, but also touched on some things that might be unique to their efforts and their regional compacts. Uh, so I'm going to touch briefly on what I see the role of the regional compact being related to Sarah, and then talk a little bit about my role in the more detail because I think that's ultimately going to loop back and help with understanding the overall role that the regional compact plays with Sarah and how we operate with Sarah at MEC. Um, so first off, I see the regional compact role with Sarah at a very high level to be approving states for membership, uh, renewing states for Sarah membership, and then uh, hopefully something that never has to happen is removing states from Sarah membership if the regional compact uh, determines a state is not abiding by the requirements of Sarah. Uh, the regional compacts oversee, uh, implement, and execute SARA in our respective regions. Uh, this one, I think, is one of the most important and unique perspectives to each regional compact, which is representing the needs, interests, and concerns of our respective states and institutions. Uh, my interpret of the interpretation of this is that regional compacts are to be a sounding board uh, and a liaison for their SARA states and institutions, uh, not only within their regions, but amongst each other, but also with NC SARA and other organizations that might be involved with the SARA agreement. Uh, each regional compact also has a regional steering committee. Uh, the regional steering committees evaluate and determine whether states uh, demonstrate, demonstrate the adequate capacity and standards to meet and oversee SARA participating institutions. And depending on uh, the regional compact, uh, steering committee roles and involvement with the agreement might vary. Uh, I work very closely with our regional steering committee at MAC and help them with their operations. I work closely with our steering committee chair to work on driving agendas and informing members, etc. Um, that's what I, where I see the regional compact role at a high level. Um, regarding my role and the way that I work with Sarah, I see it really falling into three different buckets. Um, the first bucket is state support, uh, so supporting my M. Sarah state portal agents. Uh, the second bucket is more of an overall support outreach and operations with my role. And then the third bucket, which I think is kind of behind the scenes and doesn't get discussed a whole lot, is uh, support for NC SARA staff and my regional counterparts who work with SARA. Um, and I'll just touch briefly on all three of those to give you a little bit more detail. Um, the first bucket is state support, and I serve as the primary point of contact for all of our MSARA state portal agents, so state portal agents in the Midwest. Uh, I help them with policy clarifications that stem from the SARA manual, uh, any training and onboarding if there's turnover at the state portal agency level and we get new portal agents, uh, or if they just have uh, questions with SARA policy or processes and need some help getting brought up to speed with that. 
Um, I help with maintaining and tracking institutional participation and monitoring changes in institutional status. Uh, for example, I'm sure many of you have seen the administrative forms on the NC SARA website. Um, if an institution expires because their SARA application materials haven't been submitted on time to a state portal agent, or if there's a need for an institution to be approved provisionally, um, I help the state portal agents and sometimes the institution with navigating all of that. Uh, I also help facilitate communications between state portal agents. So if there's a question in Ohio that stems into Michigan, uh, maybe uh, facilitating conversations between those two states and helping come up with solutions and answers. Um, and I also help with facilitating communication between our states and NC SARA staff members. Um, and lastly, I help states with preparing their SARA state renewal applications before they're shared with our president at MAC, Susan Hegard, and before they're shared with our MSARA regional steering committee members. And my role with that is just to help ensure that states are meeting SARA membership requirements. Uh, the second bucket that I mentioned is uh, support, outreach, and operations as a whole. Uh, I really see my role as facilitating communication with a variety of groups that are involved with SARA, uh, planning and convening meetings of our MSARA state portal entities, whether that's in person or telephonic, uh, supporting and implementing operations for our regional steering committee, uh, being a sounding board for them, convenings, uh, helping to manage steering committee membership appointments because our steering committee member terms do rotate. Uh, I plan an annual meeting each year where the two groups, our SARA state portal agents and regional steering committee members meet in person um, and other members of the SARA community uh, come join us as well. Uh, Marianne Boki and Mary Larson from NC SARA came to our annual meeting this year. Uh, Cheryl Dowd was able to join us at our annual meeting as well. Um, so it's just a great time to bring everyone together, share ideas, collect information, um, and generate some action items and next steps where we can be helpful. Uh, the third and final bucket I mentioned, uh, which I think is really one of the most important uh, from where I sit, is uh, support and supporting NC SARA staff and my regional counterparts who work with SARA. Um, I work with and communicate really regularly with uh, SARA staff at the other regional compacts, uh, Wanda and Christina, who you heard from, NC SARA staff. Uh, we par participate in meetings with each other. Uh, I attend the NC SARA board meetings and the NC SARA state portal agent meeting that takes place every year. Um, I think this is really important communication so that all the regions and various counterparts can uh, collaborate, keep each other in the loop. Um, we can share ideas and best practices, uh, not only amongst ourselves, but also with NC SARA so that uh, we're all in the know and um, we can work to share communication strategies, develop processes, um, and help each other uh, with meetings and reviewing to um, any proposed SARA policies and uh, giving feedback to the national level um, and see SARA, whether that's from us or from our stakeholders. Um, so to kind of circle back and close the loop uh, between the regional compact uh, role and what I see my role as being at the regional compact, I really see the compacts as uh, implementing and overseeing SARA operations in their regions, um, but also uh, being good facilitators, uh, convening, and being a sounding board, uh, not only for our states and our institutions in our region, um, but also with NC SARA, our counterparts in regional compacts, and also working with uh, Cheryl and Dan at WCET SAM also. So um, that wraps up what I had wanted to share with you today. Dan and Cheryl, if there are any questions you have for me or another way in which I can be helpful, I'm happy to do so. Well, thanks, Emily. That was great. Um, I personally don't have any questions at this moment. Um, Cheryl, do you? No, I don't have any questions, but I really do appreciate you being on today, Emily. That was a, a great overview of what your role is. I think people wonder, you know, how, how does that work with the interaction for the regional compact? So thank you for being so uh, specific about that. That was really helpful. And, You're very uh, welcome. I don't see any... Um, any questions in the chat box, um, but I'll give everybody one last shot. Do, any other questions you all wish to share? Comments? 
Okay. Well, we had some technical, and it may be have been on my end, so I apologize if, if I was the, uh, the tech person who caused the concerns here uh, to get Lori on the line. Um, but we do have Lori Williams with us, and I'm very happy for that. Lori, are you able to unmute yourself? Um, because we would love to introduce you. Yes. Can you hear me okay now? Oh, you sound fantastic. I'm going to give it back Good. to Dan because Dan is great at introducing people. So we'll do that. But we're we're very happy to have Lori. And so Dan, take it away. Okay. I don't have a big, huge thing planned here, but but Lori, <laughs> it's been a a really great close collaboration for years between between San and and C Sarah. And for that reason, we are so thrilled to have you so early on in your tenure to come aboard and 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 introduce yourself and and say whatever you want to say. Oh, well, th thank you, Dan. Thanks, Cheryl, and thanks, Russ. Um, we had a meeting here in the office together, live and in person, just last week, which was really fantastic. Um, I'm really excited and pleased to be serving as NC Sarah's president and CEO. Just this past month, I started on August 1st. And I, I've said this many times, but I, I think it bears repeating. I really stand on the shoulders of giants in the work that's gone before me and have tremendous gratitude for Marshall Hill, the former president, the staff, um, particularly Mary, Marianne, and now also um, Jeannie Yaki Fine. Um, in my early time at Sarah, I've been on a listening tour to learn more about all of you. I know there's a lot of overlap between WCET SAN members and NC Sarah participating institutions learn more about the work at the state level and, and needs at the state level, as well as institution needs. But most importantly, I'm interested in hearing more about students' needs. I've had conversations with all of the NC SARA board members now, including the four regional compact presidents, and I'm getting to know them and what's on their minds. Everyone that I've talked to is very pleased with the work that NC SARA has, has been doing. Um, with the help and hard work of all of you. And I know at the institution level, it does take work to remain in compliance with NC SARA requirements for participation. I've been on that end of the um, spectrum, so to speak, in my work previously at academic institutions. I've got more to learn in order to help shape the future direction of NC SARA. Um, but for now, I see this direction including at least two important objectives. The first is to strengthen the confidence of all of the states and institutions and the general public in our state authorization reciprocity agreement and organization. And to be a recognized thought leader and force for strong quality distance education in the United States. I'll continue to be on my listening tour, hearing more from all of you and from other NC SARA members about new potential areas for focus for NC SARA. There'll be some environmental scanning, some more listening tour activities, surveys, and um, then we'll engage in a more formal strategic planning process. Um, it's really clear that we do need to consider how to best increase our focus on um, quality assurance and consumer protection as a subset of that. My experience includes many years in distance education program development and in quality assurance and consumer protection at WASC as a vice president. So I look forward to hearing from you about how we can do better in that regard and discuss how we can best serve all of our stakeholders. I'm at lwilliams at nc-sara.org. And thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit. That's fantastic. Yeah, I really appreciate Lori being able to take the time with us today to do this. Um, like she said, especially since she just started on August 1st. So we're really lucky that she could have the time. Um, are there any questions uh, for Lori at this at this point? We have several saying hi, which is good. Um, Dan, do you have any uh, additional thoughts? Um, it looks like we have a couple of questions that just came in. Um, Lori, I don't know if you're, are you, are you able to see in the chat there? Yes, I'll address the first one. Okay. Uh, because it looks as though the complaint requirement will likely be dropped and, uh, and, and potentially soon, if that's part of what comes out early um, with respect to early release of the federal regulations, 
the requirement will remain as it has till now that all states that participate as members of NC Sarah must have a complaint process in place, not only for for-profit institutions, but also for nonprofit, both, both public and private. So that will not change regardless of the way in which the federal regulations may change. Um, the other, oh, was asking me to repeat our second objective, to be a recognized thought leader and a force for strong quality distance education in the United States. This is the second objective. With my experience with WASC, am I able to influence California into Sarah? Boy, I wish I had that magic wand that I could <laughs> wave it and make it so. Um, there are a number of people, more seriously, who are working behind the scenes to make this happen. And um, I do know a few folks in California. I had the privilege and honor to work with several of them on the commission at WASC, um, who are presidents of institutions that I know would love to be um, participants in SARA if their state were to become a member. So there is um, certainly a lot of effort and energy going toward that. I can't make any promises about when that might happen though. Okay, great. Well, I don't see any other questions at this time, um, but hopefully this will be the uh, continuation of a, of a dialogue that will that will go on and and uh, we look forward to continued strong collaboration uh, and thank you again for your time Lori. we really and appreciate thank you it. dan bye 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 thanks Lori. Um, all right let's kick it over to cheryl for some summary and thoughts of the san member survey that took place earlier this summer cheryl go ahead thank you uh, as you all may remember, uh, we uh, provided another survey for our SAN members uh, this summer. We had not done one in two years. And so we do feel it's very important to have um, input from our members, which is one of the reasons why we created the SAN advisory group as well, so that we could have interaction with members and uh, representation for our planning. And so we did do a SAN survey this summer. Um, we asked a handful of questions, got some good responses, and we really do appreciate it. We concentrated this, um, this survey on the different activities that we offer. So our first question was about certain activities and whether uh, they were used by the membership and uh, whether they were found um, either um, never used, not at all useful, a little bit useful, moderately useful, very useful, extremely useful. And the reason I describe all of those different options is because it was very interesting in the roughly, oh, I would say about 10 items that we had, um, what we could definitely see is that the majority of the folks um, that uh, responded found that our um, services were at least moderately useful um, all the way through extremely useful. There were several things, especially around the, the, around the idea of face-to-face -face, um, events that people are not able to attend, and we understand that, but we did not find that people on the whole found our um, services either not useful or only a little bit useful. They really, um, we were pleased to find that um, the benefits that we do offer, the services that we do offer, people do, um, do uh, use those and find them at least moderately useful. Um, so, it, and we found that it was really interesting because the second question was around the idea of if we had to remove any services, which services did the membership find were a priority that we should keep? And so it confirmed that all of the 11 roughly or 10 that we had in that previous question should stick around. It was really interesting to see how adamant, because it was, a, it was a, um, an open-ended question. So people were rather adamant about maintaining um, all of the things that we had listed in the previous um, section, people want to see us keep. Um, so they were things like having the face-to-face -face opportunities like coordinator meeting or going to NASAPs and collaborating on, on that conference, having the workshops, and then of course the virtual things in regard to our email alerts and discussions, our open forum, webcasts, the Frontiers blog, SAN website, Sensational Awards, and also direct assistance from SAN staff. Um, all of those were mentioned um, in this open-ended question that they should all be maintained. 
um, there were questions, there was a question about what ancillary topics would uh, people like to see SAN tackle? And uh, there was a lot of uniformity there around the idea of professional licensure disclosures, accessibility, and Secretary of State information. And those are our tall orders that we are trying to crack on and uh, trying to make some um, inroads with the uh, professional boards so that we can gain better access to some information. So we are very aware that those are important aspects um, and unfortunately, they're not the quick turnaround aspects, um, but we are trying to, to make progress there. But in the meantime, we'll be working on some um, best practices for managing um, this type of work. Uh, the next question was about, you know, what other sources uh, do our members use for information about state authorization compliance? And uh, we found um, that our members tended to look at um, we have uh, great relationships with several law firms and so and they put out uh, articles and alerts and so people are reading their articles and alerts which we appreciate because they are good um, colleagues uh, with us we um, so I was pleased to see that they also look to NC Sarah and to the compacts uh, for uh, information and then there were several and I loved this they talked about the interaction amongst other members. So they seek collaboration with other members of SAN um, when they uh, want to find out uh, information about state authorization compliance. So um, I'm glad to see the interaction of our network. Those were our goals. And then um, we talked about new initiatives. You know, you will recall that just in the last year, we, had, we elected our first SAN advisory group um, I think we we're going through that right now and they started in the fall and then we started also the special interest teams and they started their small group work in the winter and uh, we've just this summer started the sand podcast and we wanted to see you know what people um, how people were, were looking at those and what was their level of awareness most seem to be aware but a large percentage of those um, had not paid as much attention to them yet they weren't as as completely knowledgeable about them yet so um, there was the then the last question was uh, which initiatives would they like to hear more about and so um, I found that that was very interesting that uh, they um, seem to indicate that all of those initiatives they would like to hear more about, so those new initiatives. Um, and so I anticipate at the SAN coordinator meeting we'll start, we'll start to hear um, more about what the SAN advisory group did for this year. And then also the special interest teams have um, indicated that they're getting to a point where they may be able to share some of their outcomes. That was what they were hoping to create deliverables um, to share with the network. So I know that they're close to that and we're, you know, starting to work on, we'll talk about our SAM podcast in a minute, but we have another podcast in the planning. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, so the in summary, I would say um, about these responses for the entire survey, uh, I'm very grateful. I know Dan's grateful as well uh, about the folks that uh, were participating in our survey. And we also thank them. There were several, actually quite many, that indicated that they liked the work of SAN and wanted to let us know that. So we're very grateful for that. Um, they are looking forward to the advisory group and special interest team updates. And they've asked about um, a quick start primer um, for um, new, new members. And we actually have a, uh, are working on a program that will help people move through our SAN website. Because if you look at our SAN website, our homepage, plus the landing pages, and we have a state authorization 101 link at the top, provide a lot of this um, uh, of this beginner information about aspects of state authorization um, because there are obviously, as we know, multiple aspects of state authorization. So um, we've been working, Dan has reached out to uh, collaborate with someone who will help us have a more direct um, and framework um, for people to move through our website if they are particularly looking to um, get them, get acquainted with the issue of state authorization and the multiple angles that that may take. So 
overall, I would say the survey was um, was very helpful. And again, um, we're very grateful to those who participated in the survey. And um, so we will, uh, I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any questions about that. And uh, just, just to let you all know, yes, we did have a hiccup with the sand advisory um, voting. Um, it appears that uh, we need to um, look at the tool because we're concerned about how it was um, um, how it was being how it was uh, working properly or improperly for some folks. So we are meeting with the SAN advisory group this week, uh, the four members that are part of that right now, uh, to talk about possibly using a different tool and maybe providing a little bit of directions around it so that it we can ensure that this is um, a very um, uh, um, direct and, and proper election um, of this last member. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, Dan, do you have any comments about the SAN survey that you wish to share as well? No, I think that's a pretty good, uh, I think it's a pretty good summary. I, I, I also want to thank the advisory group um, and Dan for helping prepare uh, this survey to go out to everyone. So thank you to all of you who um, helped prepare uh, this survey. We find it very beneficial. We'll be sharing this, as I said, with the SAN advisory group this week um, to do a deeper dive and see what we can do, um, you know, to make sure that we're moving in a direction that is beneficial for, uh, for SAN. Okay, great. I guess the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, the survey was, was a one kind of formal way of seeking feedback, but as you all know, we're always open to feedback at, in other ways at any time. So uh, you know how to reach us, um, including feedback on our summer podcast series. Um, hope some of you have, have enjoyed it. Um, learned something about musicals from Cheryl, if nothing else. We will have one more up in our, in our summer pilot series, although maybe closer to September, August. Um, and uh, we're, we're working to confirm our guest right now. Um, so I'll just let the suspense build, I suppose. Um, but we, we've enjoyed it and hopefully you, you have learned something from it as well. Um, finally, please just take note of the, the, uh, um, announcements below. If you liked what Russ had to say, there'll be much more of it on September 10th. Uh, come ask questions, any questions you have about what happened this summer. And then of course, good seats available for the annual meeting and the coordinator day before uh, on the day before it starts. So we hope to see you all at those things. And um, unless there's anything else, does anybody have any, any questions, comments now? I'd just like to add just a little bit about the WCET annual meeting. If you go to the site where the registration is, this link, um, it'll take you to the homepage for the annual meeting and you can find the agenda there for the entire meeting. So the SAN quarter meeting, coordinator meeting will be the first, actually the day before the WCET meeting actually starts. So uh, you, can, um, you can register for that by itself if you do not wish to attend the WCET annual meeting. There is no charge for attending the SAN coordinator meeting. So I repeat that, there is no charge for, for attending the SAN coordinator meeting. And you can do that without attending the WCET annual meeting. However, I would encourage you, if you are able, to attend the WCET annual meeting because there is, um, there is a wealth of information and interactions that you can have at the annual meeting. And I strongly urge um, our SAN folks to uh, learn other things at the annual meeting. There are a lot of areas of higher ed that um, interact with our role as uh, compliance, compliance people for state authorization. And I think that you would benefit from being able to learn from that. So if you have the opportunity, I would suggest you do it. And there is a code that is requested and it's it depends, all caps, no spaces. And so um, you'll wish to do that. Um, yes, uh, if you, uh, uh, Davida, if you want to email me, um, yes, you may some, send someone in your place if you as a coordinator are not able to come. Um, and then uh, someone had a question about the guide. Oh, Cheryl, um, I see you have a question about the guide. Um, 
Yes, we, we are aware that uh, not all of the states had responded. Um, so uh, what she's referring to is you recall that the SHEO surveys um, are no longer live. Uh, they had had some time where they weren't being maintained. They didn't have the, the, man, the manpower to do that within SHEO. It wasn't really part of their mission. Um, it is now part of the new NC Sarah website, which I urge you to go view. And part of the NC Sarah website is now what's called the State Authorization Guide, or for short, the guide. And you can find that uh, on the NC Sarah website. And um, you click on the state authorization guide, you'll see it in the top. And uh, you'll see there that many of the states have responded, but not all states have responded. And we did not, and, and this was a, a decision that was made not just to um, wait. Uh, we could be waiting and waiting and waiting. And we wanted to um, make sure that there were resources available um, for folks. So that was the reason why it was put up before all the states had responded. But, uh, Mary Ann and, as, has been leading the charge there, uh, working with the higher ed agencies, and we appreciate that um, to, um, to gain their responses. And that's been something that uh, Mary Ann and, and Shannon and Dan have been working very hard on uh, to move that forward. Um, somebody asked about the link for open forum meeting. Um, that link is right there on the agenda, and you can also find it on the home page of the SAN website. So if you wish to use, um, if you wish to join Zoom, you don't have to register in advance. It's not like a webcast. You can just come on like you do for the SAN coordinator call. And so just link in at the, at the correct time and you can be part of the open forum. Any other questions? Okay, um, well, uh, Dan, I'll let you close, but I, I just wanna say thank you to everybody. And um, I'm gonna turn it back to Dan. Okay, great. Um, thank you all for your time. This is a busy time of year, especially, and so we really appreciate it, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Goodbye.